Welcome to our first of the podcast series designed to introduce you to corporate social responsibility. In this series, we'll cover a range of topics from CSR's history to modern debates and discussions about what it can and should mean to be socially responsible in a modern organizational context. We'll have two objectives in this lecture. First, to define what we mean by CSR, and second, to explore its history. When you research CSR in both academic and industry sources, you'll find a wide range of definitions. Each definition is likely to be tied to a particular perspective and attitude about what ought to be included and excluded as socially responsible organizational behavior. In public relations, our core focus and interest is on the relationships between organizations and their stakeholders. Therefore, this definition is most complementary to our field. The other reason I think this is a pretty good definition for CSR is that it's fluid, culturally adaptable, and situationally adaptable. This is important because we can't assume that what is socially responsible is universal. It's also important to take note that nothing in this definition makes social responsibility the sole domain of the private sector. Though the concept is born in the corporate world, the drivers of social responsibility and the reality that any organization ought to demonstrate its social responsibility is something that goes well beyond the corporate realm. Our public institutions must continually demonstrate that they are serving the public interest. Our nonprofits and charities also face the same kinds of pressures. Though the pressures across the corporate, public, and nonprofit domains for social responsibility might be different or manifest differently, most of the underlying concepts are applicable. Underlying most theories, perspectives, and practice on CSR are three critical factors or drivers of decisions regarding social responsibility. First is that it is stakeholder behavior driven. That what organizations ought to care about is how stakeholders react to an organization. So it's in the organization's best interest to treat them relatively equitably. Second, CSR is strategy driven. Though the strategy may come from different sources, it will typically value cultures of ethics and support where internal demands such as employee quality or external demands such as fulfilling mission or acting as a role model for society might be valued and enshrined in organizational practice. Third, it is also public policy driven to the extent that any organization uses social resources. And so the assumption with CSR is that it should also create value for society. Now, while the formalization of social responsibility started to take form in the 1950s, there were a number of critical developments before the 1950s that shaped it. According to management historian Daniel Wren, during the Industrial Revolution in the U.S. and U.K., there are substantial criticisms about the emerging factory system, particularly with regard to the employment of women and children. Reformers in both countries perceived the factory system to be the source of many social problems, including labor unrest, poverty, and slums. Emergent industrial betterment or welfare movements mixed with humanitarianism, philanthropy, and also some business acumen to produce welfare schemes. These emerged from the movement that tried to prevent labor problems and improve performance by taking actions that could be interpreted as both good for business as well as being socially appropriate. Examples of these include things like hospital clinics, bathhouses, lunchrooms, profit sharing, and even recreational facilities. Also in this period, many of the early business leaders had a tradition of generosity and philanthropy that had origins in earlier areas like patrons of the arts, builders of churches, and so on. So at this time, there are programs that became codified as they emerged, being focused on social responsibility, though it wasn't called this. One of the exemplars of this in the United States were company towns. In 1893, a modern industrial community at Pullman was created in the south side of Chicago. George Pullman of the Pullman Palace Car Company created a community town 
built with strong standards of housing, appearance, lighting, and maintenance that exceeded anything else of its time. It had parks, playgrounds, a church, arcades, theaters, and a casino. And this was created for the benefit of his employees. The YMCA was actually a second example of early social responsibility initiatives that were started in London in 1844 and quickly spread, including to the United States, where it was supported by individuals and companies. And in fact, uh, the YMCA early became associated and closely linked with railroad companies in the early days. From 1918 to 1929, the community chess movement helped to shape business views of philanthropy as one of the earliest forms of social responsibility. As business executives came in contact with social workers, new views of corporate responsibility began to emerge. Business ladder leaders began to be exposed to others' views as to what constituted social problems in society and became more conscious of the mission of social agencies. So as professional voices emerged, business people were hearing from these folks whose educational and professional training merited respect, and their views on the relationships between business and society couldn't be easily dismissed. Now certainly this kind of behavior wasn't always the case, but it was emerging as an important part of doing business in this time. But in the 1950s, there was a decade more of talk than action with respect to social responsibility. This was a period of changing attitudes, with business executives learning to get comfortable talking about society, social responsibility, and how companies fit into that. However, outside of specific philanthropy, there were very few corporate actions that stood out. During this period, giving continued to be ad hoc, something that was subject to executive whim, and particularly in response to requests by beneficiary organizations, with primary re uh, recipients being the YMCA, Red Cross, local community chests, and local hospitals. But there just wasn't much evidence of changes in boards of directors, social audits, social education of business managers, or even development of business codes of conduct in the 1950s, though all of these were actually talked about. So if there is limited evidence of CSR throughout the 1950s and before, the decade of the 60s marked a monumentous growth in attempts to formalize our understanding and application of CSR in business situations. And there are important scholarly efforts. For example, Keith Davis, who wrote extensively about CSR in business and society textbook, defined it as businessmen's decisions and actions taken for reasons at least partially beyond the firm's direct economic or technical interest. Davis argued that social responsibility itself was a nebulous idea, but that it should be seen in a management context. He asserted that some socially responsible business decisions can be justified by a long, complicated process of reasoning as having a good chance of bringing long-run economic gain to the firm, thus paying it back. This was really early articulations of the importance of a positive reputation. Other scholars continued to redefine this definition, but came to three characteristics of CSR. At its heart, what it came down to. First, that these were voluntary corporate actions. That is, they couldn't be coerced into it. Second, there is at least an indirect linkage between a company and other voluntary organization. Early examples of strategic alliances. And third, that there are intangible outcomes, that is, those that cannot be directly measured as profit and loss or direct return on investment. Harold Johnson's 1971 book, Business and Contemporary Society, Frameworks and Issues, was one of the first books of the decade to focus on CSR, but it provided a clear framework for what socially responsible firms should be doing. What he proposed was that socially responsible firms are able to balance multiple interests and cited specific examples of stockholders, employees, suppliers, de 
dealers, local economies, and even national interests. Clearly a precursor to the concept of stakeholder relationship management, what's very clear about this was that CSR was emerging as something about more than just employees and philanthropy. Up to this point, those who owned companies had all the power, and it was assumed that they would serve theirs, their boards, and their shareholder interests. However, attitudes began to change, and the power of the consumer, or public, was beginning to be recognized more directly. They stated that the business functions by public consent, and its basic purpose is to serve constructively the needs of society to the satisfaction of society. Johnson and his contemporaries argued that there was a social contract between business and society, and it was changing in substantial and important ways because businesses were being asked to assume broader responsibilities to society and serve a broader range of human values. In this way, they suggest that, that businesses are being asked to contribute to the quality of people's lives rather than just supplying quantities of goods and services. In the 1970s, we began to see an acceleration of corporate social responsibility. So the conceptual conceptualization of social responsibility in the 70s focused on three concentric circles. In the inner circle is the company's economic function. This includes clear-cut basic responsibilities for the efficient execution of the economic function, products, jobs, economic growth. Second, the direct social responsibility function in the intermediate circle encompasses the responsibility to exercise this economic function with a sensitive awareness to the changing social values and priorities. For example, with respect to environmental conservation, hiring in relation with employees, even a more rigorous set of expectations from consumers regarding information and fair treatment. Then third, the outer circle outlines the ways that organizations can serve society. Now this was newly emerging and still set of, uh, still an amorphous set of responsibilities that business should assume to become more broadly involved in directly improving the social environment. For example, what an organization could do to alleviate poverty within its community. So as CSR became began to take a more modern form in the 1970s, we saw these kinds of activities emerge as being directly related to perceptions of social responsibility. On this slide, we can see a range of activities related to charity and cause-related activity to more core business functions like customer service, product quality, and truthfulness. Then as we shift into the 1980s, we can see this as a period of widely reported ethical scandals that brought to the public's attention the managerial and corporate wrongdoing. Examples of scandals included the infant formula controversy that spanned most of the 1970s and half of the 1980s, the 1984 Union Carbide Bhopal explosion in India killing thousands, controversy over companies doing business in South Africa, insider trading, yet at the same time we saw fundamental changes in governance in the West, especially in the U.S. and U.K., as homes to so many multinational corporations that relaxed regulations on these types of companies. So as we begin to consider the contemporary themes of social responsibility, we start to bring into the mix branding and this notion that social responsibility becomes more than just doing good. So in addition to the codification of CSR initiatives on the local, national, and international levels, another major trend that characterized the 1990s and continues today is the emergence that many companies have developed and focus on reputation for their CSR practices. Though sometimes questioned for their authenticity, companies like The Body Shop, Ben & Jerry's, Patagonia, Esprit, Aveda, and Stonyfield Farms represent some of those small companies that grew large while embracing CSR practices. Large companies that developed CSR-related reputations included IBM, Johnson & Johnson, Nike, 
Merck, Prudential Insurance, Levi Strauss, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's. So what we can see is that we bring CSR initiatives to produce differentiation for organizations, that the identity of an organization and the emphasis on reputation is viewed as something that can have potential power and influence for an organization. So, if we think about what social responsibility is, where it's come from over the last hundred or so years, we can see the table set for the controversies and the debates surrounding it.